tell us about the emotions of that moment? Well, I had my emotions very under control because at the last minute, I mean, for about the, the year before, I had assumed we would most likely just narrowly pull it off. Um, and I remember saying the night before to someone from the BBC, we're going to win by about three or four votes. Um, and we'd kept it quiet. I mean, we'd known we were most likely about four votes ahead since May. But we kept it quiet because we didn't want the French to know because they were playing a very low-key game. Um, so. I, I resisted the temptation to bet on London because the odds were about, you know, three or four to one, you know. Um, and then we walked into the room and all the journalists and cameras were in front of the Paris delegation. And Tess and I decided that someone had tipped them off that Paris had actually won. So I was gearing, I was suppressing my emotion. And there's this lovely picture of everybody jumping in the air, me standing there looking glum, you know. Um, and I suppose everybody else except for Seb and Craig Reedy and me went off to the party. And we went then through about two hours of interviews, then the formal signing. And you know, it's like after three hours you get to a party and everyone else is smashed and you're sober and you just can't get into it. And I remember at the very end of it, I was getting ready to go and a man came up to me, an Englishman, expat. I said, Mr. Livingston, I want you to come with me. The surprise of your life. And I looked around, my security detail had disappeared, my staff were all chatting away to other people. I said, I really can't, I need to, to get to bed. And she said, no, please come with me. I said, I really can't. I said, look, I want to take you to the best brothel in Singapore. Um, and I've often thought, that's absolutely bizarre, there was no cameras around to capture that moment, no journalists, ears flapping. I went to bed. I, I've often wondered what specialities they must have got there. Happy memories, <laughs> but the very next day, mm. I remember it all turned to mm. tragedy with that awful news from mm. London, and you were in tears. Well, the... It's odd, it was difficult keeping. I didn't, I don't think I did actually cry because you knew you had to hold it together and try and make sure London got through it. And our worry had always been that there'd be people start attacking mosques. After 9-11, we had a terrible situation where a group of racists savagely beat up a Sikh driver because of a minicab driver, they couldn't tell a Sikh from Muslim and he was left virtually permanently disabled. So there's always that worry that a death toll in London could really unleash things, and we just had to keep people united on that, and it worked. I mean, after about a month, everyone started having a rouse about what should have been done, whose fault everything was, but we got through that period without any... There's no recorded incident of an attack on a mosque or a Muslim. There's a couple of bits of graffiti were sprayed, that was about it. And so I was very focused, and I'd known this was coming for years. I was just amazed. After 9-11, we knew we must be the second prime target. Um, and I, I was, just before we went off to Singapore, the head of MI5, Eliza Manning and Buller came to see me. And I was saying, you know, I'm beginning to think our security must be so good that we've got it licked. She said, she said, no, it's incredibly dangerous out there. So I wasn't surprised. Maybe you weren't in tears, but... Oh, it's very difficult to hold it together, though, yeah. Can you remember the words? Oh, I can, yeah, because people keep playing them all the time, so I know I get to forget them. But it's when I go back to it now and hear the recording, then I cry. Um, but I remember in the weeks that followed, you know, visiting hospitals, and one of the surgeons was chatting with me, saying she'd just been there at the um, hospital in East London opposite Whitechapel and there'd just been case after case coming in and she just worked and worked on the emergency surgery and she said and then when I got home and I heard your speech I started to cry and I said you've got to stop I can't think back to that you know um, but now it doesn't matter you know the emotion can come flooding up but it couldn't then there was so much going on we weren't certain whether there was going to be another attack and of course there was another failed attack um, it was the most intense period of my life. You 
look at it dewy oh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to think back to that because what is moving is how well Londoners cope with it. So in the years that followed, we had loads of mayors come to visit me to ask, you know, how do you do the congestion charge? Well, how do you bid for the Olympics? And almost all of them said, how did you get through that without real violence afterwards? Because that's what would have happened in most of the world. And you actually look, we have created a city completely by accident, no one planned it, which is genuinely relaxed about difference, you know, whether it's colour, faith or whatever. I mean, I, when I grew up in London after the war, I can remember even in the early 1970s, people would say, I saw a black man out with a white woman, I don't feel comfortable with that. Now you walk through our local park, I mean, every, every combination of races and faiths, nobody notices if your child or your grandchild is mixed race. The years have gone by, mm. from 2005, we're now in 2012, the Olympics mm. are here. Are they the kind of Olympics that you envisaged when you well, started out that campaign to get them to London? We envisaged security being about half the level that it is, but then back in 2005, six, I mean, you, you wouldn't have assumed we'd be in Afghanistan in these numbers, you know, I think. Didn't the Secretary of State for Defence say it may not be necessary for a shot to be fired when they went in in 2006, I can't remember. Um, and I would, have been, I would have insisted on these VIP lanes being open to cabs and buses and bikes. And I don't think I'd have agreed one up to Park Lane. If the IOC members want a, a good hotel, there are very good hotels now in East London. You know, the idea we've got this lane all through central London just so the sponsors and the IOC members can stop in their favourite Park Lane hotel is rubbish. That, but apart from that, it's gone almost exactly as we planned. I mean, the original strategy has gone through. I mean, there's been these hiccups with I mean, the security side. But I mean, no, it's turned out exactly as we planned. It came in on time, it came in on the budget we finally set. Um, and the legacy is going to be amazing. What about the cost? You said that it would be a cost of a walnut whip. Which For Londoners, as long as the government picked up 90% of the bill, which we persuaded them to. I mean, initially, we thought it would cost 4.2 billion. But that was only a guesstimate because you could, I mean, to do a really costed um, thing would take about a year. Most likely would have cost a couple hundred million. It's coming at twice that, hasn't it? Well, it's coming twice. But, I mean, you couldn't justify that given the odds were so strong against us at that stage. But one of the reasons the bill's higher is having won the Olympics, I then went to see Yvette Cooper, who's then the minister responsible, say, look, there's even more land south of the Olympic Park, between the Olympic Park and the Thames. It's room for 50,000 jobs, 40,000 homes. We don't want to come back and have to dig up all the power and the water and the, the transport system, you know, 15 years down the road. Let's build the infrastructure for both sites. And so literally, the moment the mayor can get round the world, schlepping around the world now saying, look, We've got this vast brownfield site ready to build on, just 30 minutes from Heathrow Airport. I can't think of any other major city in the West that's got such a potential development site so close to where all the life is. <coughs> so it costs a little bit more than you anticipated, mm. but it was worth it. Oh, absolutely, because, I mean, I always said, no mayor would have been able to persuade any government to give £9 billion to do up the East End of London. Everyone in Parliament hates London. I mean, everyone in Russia hates Moscow. Everyone in, in America hates New York. They all hate the mega city. They, they like going there, but they're also envious and so on. We'd never have got it, particularly out of Gordon Brown, who was very grumpy about London generally. So it was only the Olympics. Once you'd won, they had to spend the money.